Zephaniah, and we're going to go through some high points here in uh, Brother Whitaker's book, and uh, then we'll go through some some outline material, um, and continue on in our study. Let's do as we've done so many times this year, and start off with an understanding of the significance and blessing of this book. Um, and and all these books as it relates to the Old Testament, why I study the Old Testament, what is the value of the Old Testament. Um, And and this is needful, by the way, because a lot of times folks look at the Old Testament, and um, I would say one one of a few things happens, um, well, a, a couple ways people look at the Old Testament. Sometimes people gloss over it and say, well, that's the Old Testament, I don't really need to study it, um, because we're now under the New Testament system, and so... I don't want to get caught up in the dates and the rulers and uh, the fluctuations throughout the book and throughout the the books of the Old Testament. And uh, it it bogs me down and I don't really see the value in it. So they just kind of ignore it altogether uh, because it's a lot to digest. Uh, Other folks go the opposite extreme and they get caught up in the Old Testament to the point, and you see this especially now, with what's going on in the Middle East, with uh, the secular nation of Israel and Hamas, uh, the whole situation there regarding the conflict, uh, Gaza. um, They get all caught up into the Old Testament and thinking that the various (coughs) um, prophecies and and various details of the Old Testament are relevant today. Uh, And so let's just kind of level set um, and be reminded, as we've done many times, uh, what is the value of studying these books? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's notice there, starting verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so, <coughs> going uh, into the Old Testament, I'm able to gain a deeper understanding of God's plan of God's promises, of God's purpose. Um, It's not fulfilled in the Old Testament, but it gives me uh, comfort in seeing that in all those changes and in all those, quote, complex details, God still delivered on his promise and brought about the gospel, brought about uh, Jesus Christ. Remember the promise made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, that through the seed of Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Uh, remember, even Peter tells us the angels didn't even know how this was going to be possible. How is it that God is going to fulfill his promise? Um, as we look at the details, the punishments, the judgments, um, the prophecies of the Old Testament, it's all pointing to that goal. That is the goal of bringing about uh, the eternal plan of salvation via Jesus Christ. And so therefore, as it relates to the Old Testament, uh, and what it's all about, Jesus is the end concerning those uh, plans and all of what the Old Testament is pointing to. Notice Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so Jesus Christ brought about the fulfillment, the, the, the purpose, the mission of the Old Testament in that the answer of God's promise that through the seed line of Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed, Jesus fulfills that. Note Galatians chapter 3 as Paul reminds us there of that promise. Uh, And notice as well the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 as Jesus states there in verse 17, do not think that uh, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And so the fulfillment of the Old Testament law was achieved in Jesus Christ. And so I don't go to the Old Testament and get caught up in the prophecies and in the details of what took place then and think that it somehow applies today, because it does not. It is all looking forward to Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of the church being built, God's eternal plan, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Uh, But I do go to the Old Testament, as Paul stated there to Timothy, and I grow in fear of the Lord. I grow in fear of an understanding regarding uh, God's sovereignty and um, the fact that he delivers on his promises. Notice as well Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And so um, 
The same is true in any one of these books. I go to these books, I look at um, what took place, and I grow in my fear, I grow in my reverence, I grow in my appreciation for God's deliverance on his promises. So let's go through uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah is about the condemnation of Judah. Uh, Micah and Isaiah were sent to correct Judah's problems, and uh, Zephaniah is going to address, uh, again, punishment and judgment um, and consequence for deviation from God's law. Themes in the book, Jesus the Lion. Jesus the Lion, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 and verse 31, our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. Uh, Larry's been going through the kingdom parables, uh, taking a look there and noticing the uh, connection between God's judgment not only on those who are not his children, but also upon those who are his children, those who are in the kingdom. Um, we find that throughout the Bible. Again, just emphasizing the error of Calvinism and once saved, always saved. Uh, note uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 22. Uh, there are conditions for salvation and uh, God has goodness, God has severity, and on those who do not continue in God's goodness, you have severity. And you find that exemplified throughout these books. So I go into these books and I find God chiding his children, correcting his children, children under the Old Testament law, and expecting obedience, expecting repentance. Um, and so we, we find that in this book as we have in, in several others. Uh, Jesus and Zephaniah, he is the pure language. Uh, key words and phrases, consume is found five times, cut is found five times, the great day of the Lord is near, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 14. Again, judgment, judgment. Uh, key verses, can someone read for me, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 2, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 2. All right, and then Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. Okay, and Judah is the sacrifice. Um, Babylon here is the uh, one who is going to deliver uh, the punishment, uh, most likely. And um, that's what's in view, uh, that this would be um, in that time period. And hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, or uh, remain silent. You know, it reminds me a little bit of children and disciplining children. Uh, when a child is corrected, uh, some children, sometimes it seems like most children, uh, like to argue and create a discussion, and they think this is a debate, and they think this is an opportunity to plead their case and explain why they did the foolish thing that they did or whatever it is they're being corrected of. Uh, but what does the parent say? Now, I'm the parent, you're the child. Uh, just hold tight, listen to what you're being told. Correction is being delivered. Um, it's time for you to listen. We'll say something like that. So that's essentially what, what God's saying here. Uh, you need to keep quiet. You need to keep silence. You need to uh, listen. <laughs> You're being corrected. Uh, people were in the process of religious restoration. Uh, they were tearing down the idols of the land, but not the idols of their hearts. And so they were going through this motion and this process of giving the impression that they were repenting, but the reality is their hearts were still not aligned to uh, wanting to please God. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we can do this from a practical perspective. We can maybe uh, distance ourselves from, from certain activities, from certain uh, behaviors that we should be avoiding, but in actuality, our desire to please the Lord is not there. And so what we do is we exchange it. We say, well, I'm going to stop doing this or that, but I still don't really want to do what God says, and so I'm actually going to replace it over here, or I don't really want to uh, serve God. I don't really want to uh, surrender to God. Um, I'm just going to give the impression that I'm cutting this out of my life when in actuality I'm not actually interested in doing the will of the Lord. And by the way, this was a problem with God's people uh, throughout time, was it not? You think about the words of Jesus, for example, uh, in Matthew chapter 15. Someone read for me, Matthew chapter 15, 
uh, verses 1 through 9. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever you profit, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrite, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw, me, draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine commandments of men. Okay, and so it could be a physical idol and a physical behavior, or it could just be uh, a situation where loopholes are being sought in the Word of God and explanations are being offered as an excuse, which is what we have here. Um, God, your Word says to do this, but we have found a workaround. We're not really interested in obeying. We're not really interested in submitting to you. Um, you've commanded us to honor our parents. Uh, honor there is with the understanding of physical provisions. Uh, however, uh, if I give to the temple, hey, <laughs> I don't have to deal with my parents anymore. I don't have a responsibility any longer to physically provide for my parents because, you know what, I gave uh, those resources that I would have otherwise uh, applied to the care of my parents to the temple. And so because I gave it to the temple, hey, you know what? I am clean. I am good. And the leaders, of course, encourage this. Why would the leaders have encouraged this? Well, because they're benefiting from it. Um, and so you have here um, just another example of what took place throughout God's Old Testament people and what we continue to struggle with, uh, which is this attempt to justify and get around what it is that God expects, because we really want to do things our own way. Yes, it does, absolutely. Um, there's a certain way that I want things to be. In other words, God, I don't want to give you my heart. I don't want to submit myself over to you. But I'm going to take care of all these other things, and because I'm doing that, God, I'm going above and beyond. And again, folks, this is found throughout Scripture. I think probably one of the best examples we can find is in the case of Saul, which we study frequently. Uh, and again, it reminds me of children. You know, you, you tell children, do X. And then children will say, well, I'm not going to do X. But I'm going to go do this. And then because I did that, that absolves me of doing X, and I'm good. And as parents, we know that doesn't fly. No, I told you to do X. I, don't, I mean, you can't exchange. You don't, you're not the one that makes the rules here. <laughs> you're the child. And again, we're God's children. We're God's creation. And so you have that example of Saul. Uh, be reminded here of this. Um, God had, having commanded uh, what was to take place regarding the Amalekites, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and then we see that the people and Saul, what do they do? They disobey God. Notice verse 9. Uh, Samuel then comes to Saul, and what does Saul do? He rushes out to meet Samuel, and he says, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get ahead of it. He's trying to create the narrative. He's trying to make the case. God, I've done everything you told me to do. Uh, Samuel says, uh, no, I still hear um, the sheep. I still hear the oxen, verse 14. You haven't done what you were told to do. Uh, then what does Saul do? He deflects, verse 15. Great leadership. I say that sarcastically, of course. Verse 15, well, it's the people. You know, even though verse 9 tells us Saul was involved in this, obviously he was included in this process. But what is the outcome? Again, Saul tries to make the case, well, God, I don't have to do what you said because I'm sacrificing for you over here. In other words, God, I am suffering in this area. I'm going above and beyond in this area. 
Sure, I'm not doing what you tell me to do in this area, but that doesn't matter because look at how much I'm doing over here in this area. What does Samuel say? Verse 22. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. In other words, you cannot replace, you can't make a deal with God and say, God, I'm going to sacrifice for you over here and because of that, I don't have to obey you over there. No. No. And God's people throughout time tried to do that. Uh, Jesus deals with that in the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament era, as you read in Matthew chapter 15. We still struggle with that uh, today. And by the way, we could point to all kinds of individual examples, uh, congregational examples, where this is attempted. We don't deal with the actual problem at hand. We're not attacking and addressing our failure to give God the entirety of our being. But, oh man, we are on it in this area. And we're going to make sure we address it in that area. Uh, we find that again throughout Scripture, and it's a problem. And God's Old Testament people were dealing with this very problem, and God is rebuking them. Uh, even though the message concerns judgment, the prophet still offers those who would repent security from God's wrath. If someone could read for me chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And remember, this is what's found throughout the minor prophets. The minor prophets deliver over and over again judgment, the minor prophets over and over again pronounce punishment, uh, failure of God's people to obey, and then the consequence of that. And again, we have failed in not being more sensitive to the reality of God's judgment. However, the minor prophets also continuously offer hope, continuously offer, yes, this is the condition you're in. Embrace it. Accept it. Fear it, but at the same time, there is hope. There is hope. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, if someone could read that for me. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together. O, o undesirable night, before this decree is issued, for the day passes like that. For the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you. For the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all ye deep of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that ye will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Okay, so there is a conditional uh, requirement in order for one to be um, spared, but there is hope. Uh, meekness, humility, seeking is expected. Um, it's not just a wish. God expects allegiance. And if that allegiance comes, then again, there is hope. Uh, Zephaniah means Jehovah hides. He is the great-grandson of one of the greatest kings of Judah, uh, Hezekiah. Uh, author and date, again, it's Zephaniah, chapter 1, and verse 1. Um, the exact date of authorship is unknown. And again, there's, there's variations in terms of when it actually came about. Um, Zephaniah was from Judah and prophesied to Judah. He prophesied to Judah during the reign of King Josiah, who was one of the most godly kings of Judah. Josiah brought about uh, tremendous reforms, uh, probably was one of the, the greatest examples of those, of those kings that uh, corrected God's people and brought them back to uh, faithfulness. And obviously, Zephaniah played a role uh, in bringing that about. Um, the nation and kingdom promise is referred to in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. As a matter of fact, um, let's go ahead and read together. Uh, there's probably a little bit more of context that we could consider. Um, let's go to chapter 3 and let's read actually uh, verses 9 through 20. Verses 9 through 20 regarding the coming Messiah and the gospel age and uh, God's eternal purpose, the kingdom. in my holy mouth. 
Uh, these pronouncements, and we've looked at them in several cases, are beautiful pictures of God's love. Um, the care that he has, um, the longing that he has concerning obedience and faithfulness. Um, as we've mentioned before, there are those uh, who would claim that God just anticipates and longs to destroy, uh, that he just wants to bring about uh, destruction, he wants to punish, uh, he does not want to give us an opportunity uh, to be right with him, but rather he is on the sidelines just waiting to pounce on us. And that is completely false. And if you look at passages such as these, you look at other passages that we've considered uh, throughout our study of the Old Testament, what we actually find uh, is the one true and only living God making it crystal clear as to our status, our predicament, our plight, the consequence of it, the punishment that we're deserving of. But then, right alongside that, what is required of us in order to avoid it, and how much he longs, uh, how aggressively he anticipates us to make that right choice so that we can be right with him. Um, you can't read that passage and say that God does not love man. Um, he longs for us to be right with Him. As a matter of fact, uh, you think about other passages throughout Scripture, think about the prodigal son. Uh, it has been said before that that is Im incorrectly titled. It should not be titled the prodigal son. It should be titled the loving father. Uh, because what does that father do? It takes him back, and, and not only takes him back, meets him, right? Now, granted, the son, at what, what was required of the son in order for that to happen? The son had to recognize his condition. The son had to be aware of the fact that he had to make a change. Uh, the son had to become shamed, which he did. Um, but in his return, where does the father meet him? Does the father almost avoid and say, oh, I told you. I mean, think about how the father could have reacted. I told you so. You deserve it. Uh, I mean, it could have gone just so many different ways, but that's not what the father did. The father met him. The father then rejoiced, uh, emotional, and then obviously pronounced a feast and uh, a complete celebration given the return of the son. And so, what a blessing it is to find the full picture of God, which, by the way, has to include the discipline, has to include the chiding. And what happens is people want to look at either extreme. Uh, there are those who want to only see God 
from a disciplinary lens and just constantly harp on God pronouncing judgment and God needing to be feared. All true things. Uh, but then completely ignore the love and the desire to be right with man. And then there are others who want to only focus on that side. They want to ignore the punishment. They don't want to pay any attention to God pronouncing judgment, to God expecting faithfulness, to God saying these are the consequences of your, your wrongdoings. They don't want to pay any attention to that. They only want to look at the love and the anticipation of being with man. And so you have to look at both. You have to look at both. Uh, and we find that again uh, throughout Scripture. A any comments just before we dig in a little bit deeper? Yes. Yeah, let, let, let's, go to the, let's go to the passage, actually, because it's, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, Luke chapter 15, and we won't read the whole passage, but notice uh, to Danny's point here. Uh, notice here, and again, recognize the son. Verse 19, uh, actually verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And then notice verse 17, he came to himself. He came to himself. He realized his predicament. He's acknowledging his, his failure, verse 18. Uh, verse 19, what is he going to say to his father? I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I have failed. I need you. Uh, and he arose, verse 20, and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and to Danny's point and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Uh, and then again, just the continuation of his... Um, appreciation for his son's return. Uh, what a beautiful picture. Any other comments or thoughts? Yes. 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 Amen. Correct. Amen. Amen, brother. I mean, and that's the extreme of the denominational world. The denominational world says, well, I have faith, but then they don't do what God says. Faith without works is dead. But then also in the dominational world, and again, remember, I was raised in Catholicism. It was very much, you make X number of sandwiches, you go to X number of soup kitchens, you, you, you know, do these number of, of deeds, and hey, you're good. You're confirmed. You're now you know, uh, good to go. <laughs> you, you got your ticket when you have absolutely no idea what God's Word says, and you are not aligned to Him at all. Uh, so yes, there's both of those extremes, and you have those cases throughout Scripture. Um, you have cases where those thought they could just kind of do things their own way and completely ignore God's will. Uh, Naaman, for example, right? Behold, I thought. <laughs> this isn't the way I want to do it. I should just be able to think that the outcome is what, it, what I want it to be and it should just happen, but I'm going to ignore God's will. But then you also have situations where it's like, well, uh, we know your will, God, but we're going to find another way to kind of get around it. We're going to go through these motions. We're going to go through these works, but we're not going to actually... Do what you say. We're not going to actually give ourselves to you. And so you have both instances. Any other comments? All right, so let's look at a couple more uh, points here um, that, are, that are relevant and helpful. Um, let's look at some more application points. Um, so let's look at some of the sins regarding Judah. Uh, let's go to uh, Zephaniah chapter 1. And can someone read for me there verses 7 through 13? Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. Their hearts, the Lord will not give good gifts to them. 
whatever the wealth will hinder how that they will build houses, not heaven. Okay, so all areas in terms of uh, lifestyles, mindsets are dealt with here, um, all in the general sense. Uh, princes are dealt with, verses 7 and 8, so even those of the nobility. Uh, idolaters are dealt with in verse 9. Uh, merchants there, notice verses 10 um, and 11. And again, um, relevant there because, you know, you, you have folks who, th- who think sometimes, well, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a corrupt politician. I'm not a corrupt lawyer or, you know, uh, ruler. But, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a hard worker. You know, I, I'm one that, you know, s- s- keeps my head down and, and goes in day in and day out, uh, hitting the pavement. Uh, all are dealt with here. Uh, princes, idolaters, merchants. Notice also verse 12, interesting, the indifferent. The indifferent. Uh, those that are settled in complacency who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. In other words, a lack of sensitivity and concern regarding the power of God, his sovereignty, and again, man's plight. Just indifferent, complacency, um, apathetic. Uh, And also the wealthy are included as well. Um, We've already looked at uh, the hope that God offers. Um, As we've discussed already, even God's own people, when they turn away from the Lord, are not immune to the judgment and wrath of Almighty God. Israel was guilty of divided allegiance, as we've noted. Uh, They mimicked the heathen around them in dress uh, and in practice. Um... You see that there, notice verse 8, and it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with foreign apparel. In the same day I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And so um, just those who were not faithful in heart nor in deed uh, to the will of God. All right, so we're at time for our class. We just have a few books left. Um, We're approaching here the end of the semester. Uh, Thank you all very much for the class. End of the semester. End of the year.